Let's open our Bibles together tonight, again to the book of 2 Peter. Tonight we're going to be looking in chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. As we're studying through the book of 2 Peter, we've been looking at the major theme of growing in grace. And in chapter 2, Peter is discussing about false prophets and false teachings that obviously are a hindrance to us or would be a hindrance to Christian growth. He's taking time to warn the believers because it's inevitable that we're going to encounter false doctrines and false teachers. And we can't assume that we would automatically know when we do encounter them because sometimes they are very tricky. They are intentionally deceitful. They are the wolves who come in sheep's clothing, Jesus said. They're crafty, uh, and they can often seem like, to be honest, the kind of people that you would like to follow. A lot of times they have wonderful personalities, they're pleasant to listen to, and and, uh, they have nice big uh, smiles and bright white teeth, and they just seem like nice people, you know? And that's part of the deception. And we need to be careful, and we need to be on guard, because... Their end is destruction because they have denied the Lord and they've corrupted the gospel. In verses 4 through 9 that we looked at last week, we saw that Peter uh, pointed to many Old Testament stories to prove the statement he made in verse number 3 that their destruction and their punishment is coming quickly. We looked at the angels who were cast out of heaven. We looked at the flood of Noah's day and the ungodly uh, that were punished there. And the story of Lot in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. All are proof that God knows, the Lord knows how to punish the wicked, but also how to save the righteous. Now in verses 10 through 16, we're given a a much more complete picture of what a false teacher looks like. And it's important for us to know this so that we can identify them and we can be warned against allowing them to influence us. Let's look in our text, beginning in verse number 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that counted a pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls and heart they've exercised with covetous practices cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. It's quite a picture that's painted here of these false teachers for us. And as we look at this, what we are seeing is a description of what they really are, not what they look like. Because they might maintain an appearance of godliness, but inwardly they are consumed with pride and lust and greed. And through this portion of scripture tonight, Our goal is to develop some godly discernment and not allow false teachers to influence us with their doctrines. The title of the lesson is The Follies of the False Prophets. And we're going to be looking at three broad categories of sin that they are guilty of as the Holy Spirit lays it out for us in this passage so that we can understand what they really are. So number one, from verses 10 through 12, we see that The first folly of the false prophets is the sin of pride. The sin of pride. At the end of verse number 9, Peter states that God knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day 
of judgment to be punished. And beginning in verse 10, he describes in detail the sins of the unjust that are being reserved for judgment and punishment. And it's these unjust that he is, the word chiefly is used there in verse 10, chiefly referring to, mainly referring to. He starts with an overview of their spirituality in that verse when he uses the phrase that they walk after the flesh and not in the, lu- and in the lust of uncleanness. That's just kind of the general idea of, of how they are truly. They are walking according to the fa- flesh, walking according to the lust. See, you see, false teachers, because they are false teachers, because they deny the Lord that bought them, because they're not following the true gospel, they are not spirit-filled. They are led by their flesh. And that really is the summary of the problem in their life. They follow the impulses and desires of their sinful flesh. And one of the first ways that that comes out is in their arrogance and in their pride. And it is seen, as Peter focuses here on these, in these verses, it's seen in how they speak about higher powers. Notice what he says here. He says they despise government. They're presumptuous and self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So he's referring to how, how they speak about higher powers, those that are in positions of God-appointed authority. They slander them. They disrespect those to whom they should show honor. Now, I know it's, it's frankly easy to make fun of government in general, but we need to understand that God ordains government and God ordains authorities at many different levels. And as Christians, we have a biblical responsibility to show them proper respect. From earthly government all the way up to spiritual powers, as we'll see here in this, in this passage. Your next blank, false teachers have such a high view of themselves, they do not think that they should have to submit to authority. Some words are used in verse number 10. He says they're presumptuous. They dare to defy God-given authority. They don't think they have to submit. They are self-willed is the other description that's used there. They're not going to be told by others what to do. They're going to do what they want to do. They're self-willed. So they demand respect from others. And here's the irony, is that false teachers often expect other people to respect them, but they don't show respect. It's all about them. It's all about them being in charge. It's all about them being seen as the authority in whatever way, but they don't show that same respect and honor to others. Now, There are many different levels of authority that God expects us to respect. And when Peter talks about government and dignities in verse number 10, he's really encompassing every level. He's not talking about just human government or he's not talking about, um, you know, any, any one area. He's really talking about any authority. So let's think about what are some of the authority structures that God has ordained? Well, there's the authority structure of the home. Biblically, a husband is the head of the wife and mother and father are supposed to lead children and children are to obey their parents. That's the biblical authority structure in the home. Secondly, there's the authority structure of human government, which God expects Christians to submit to as long as the human government is not contradicting God. Romans 13, 7 says, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, that's talking about paying taxes, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Whatever position of government, you go back in Romans 13, verses 1 through 3, you learn that government is ordained of God. And as Christians, we should respect that. There's authority structure in the church. God's appointed spiritual leaders to guide the flock, and Christians should follow their guidance for their own benefit. Hebrews 13 says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls that they must give account that they might do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So there's all different levels of authority. But the highest level of authority is God's authority. 
And that authority for us in our lives is found in the word of God. And the word of God is the ultimate authority which the false prophets reject. And they slander. They speak against it. They speak evil of it. How do they do that? By mistreating it. By distorting it. By twisting it. Later in this book, in chapter 3, verse 16, Peter writes, As also in all his epistles, talking about Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that is, that is the idea of they twist it, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. He's talking about the false prophets there. He calls them later in this passage that we're reading, unstable souls. And he says what unstable people do is they twist scripture and they do it to their own destruction. The thing about false teachers is they know the Bible often. They can quote a lot of verses to you, but rarely do they use those verses properly. They're twisting them and making them say what they want. And in so doing, they're defying the ultimate authority, God's authority. What would be their motive for slandering and disrespecting authority at every level? There can only be one, and that's pride. In their pride, they, ra- they put others down to raise themselves up. But Peter goes on to point out something in the next verses, and that is this, that even angels who are higher than man in power and in knowledge, even they dare not defy the authority structures that God has established. Now look back at our text here. Verse number 11, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them, that is the authorities, before the Lord. Even angels don't do that. Angels know better than to defy God-given authority. Turn over to the book of Jude for a minute. If you were to take 2 Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jude and open them up side by side, you'd find that there's a whole lot of similarities there. They're so similar, in fact, that... um, those who are of a a liberal doctrinal persuasion who reject the miraculous would say that they copied each other, and that's how we got it. I say it was because they were both inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that's why they're very, very similar. How it came to be that they ended up saying so much of the same thing exactly, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Except to say that if God repeats himself, maybe we better listen. (laughs) And in Jude, verse number 9, Jude's also talking about false prophets. And he says, And yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now what the Holy Spirit did here is he inspired and preserved through the pen of Jude an example that's not found written in our Old Testament of an angel who we would say had every right to bring a railing accusation against someone, but he didn't. Now, the angel is Michael the archangel, the head of the holy angelic host. And there was an incident that occurred right after the death of Moses, apparently, where he was contending with Satan about the body of Moses, is what he says here. Again, this isn't recorded in the Old Testament, but apparently when Moses died, Satan wanted to use his body for something, probably to try and lead the children of Israel into another form of idolatry. And so there was this dispute that was going on, but Michael the archangel facing off against Satan, even then he did not bring a railing accusation, but instead he said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, if anyone had a quote unquote right to speak evil of someone else, Michael the archangel had the right to speak evil of the devil. Would you agree? But even then he didn't he recognized that that was God's place. Zechariah 3 and verse number 2, the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. It is God's place to do the rebuking of authority, not ours. And so that's what, that's what Peter's talking about in verse number 11. Even angels know better than to do that. False teachers consistently elevate themselves while simultaneously denigrating God-given authority. 
He goes on to say in verse number 12 that they're like wild animals. As natural brute beasts, he says. What are wild animals? You get any any collection of wild animals of any sort. It's very fascinating. You will find that almost without exception, there will be a struggle in that group to establish dominance. How many of you have chickens? All right. You have chickens? You ever heard the expression pecking order? Okay. Where did that come from? Well, if you put a bunch of birds together, chickens, a bunch of hens, it's not going to take them very long to squabble and fight and figure out which hen is going to be in charge. And they will establish, we call it a pecking order, because they will literally peck each other to establish who is stronger, who is bigger, who's more feisty, whatever it might be. What are they doing? Well, as natural brute beasts, they're just establishing the hierarchy, all right? They're just fighting for dominance. One, they all want to be on top, but there can only be one on top. And so whichever one's bigger, stronger, faster, feistier, that's the one that's going to be on top. Well, that's what false prophets do. Like natural brute beasts, they fight for dominance. And then it says that they speak evil of things that they know not. That they understand not. Just like those wild beasts fighting for dominant, they're just as ignorant as some of those same animals when it comes to the truth of God's word. They're ignorant concerning those things which are holy and honorable. And so all they can do is ridicule them and slander them. But here's the, here's the bigger problem in that. And that's this. They don't understand something, so they mock it. And what that means is that their understanding is the standard by which they judge the truth of something. So if they don't understand it, they declare it must be false. And they make their own understanding, their own knowledge, and their own wisdom the standard. And that's how they operate. The false prophet operates entirely based on what they think and feel to be true. And so they declare, I don't understand it. It must be true. That's ridiculous. We're not going to believe that. They speak evil of things that they understand not. And really, that's the height of arrogance right there. To say that something's wrong simply because you don't understand it. And so they will utterly perish in their corruption, the end of verse 12 says. Like the fallen angels, like the ungodly world of Noah's day, like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they will utterly perish in their corruption. It's the sin of pride. The second folly we see here is the sin of lust. The sin of lust. Verse 13 of 2 Peter 2 says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Their sin does not stop at pride. It goes on from there. They also indulge the fleshly lust by which they walk, back in verse number 10, and they do so by indulging in a hedonistic lifestyle of luxury. The word hedonism is a philosophy, it's talking about a philosophy of life that basically says you live for pleasure. You live for pleasure. Whatever's going to make you happy, whatever you think is fun, whatever is enjoyable to you, that's what you live for. It goes all the way back to the Greek, ancient Greek times. Very popular philosophy for people to live by. And we see it all over the world today, especially here in America. People live for fun. They live for pleasure. It's all about what, what's going to make me happy. And that's the way the false, false prophets live. Notice the expression that's used here. Warning of their judgment again. He says they receive the reward of unrighteousness. But then in describing them further, he says they counted a pleasure or count it pleasure... That word pleasure is the root word for hedonism. To riot in the daytime. Now, here's an interesting thing about that word riot there. It doesn't mean a violent protest like we think of today. But it means softness, effeminate or luxurious living. Isn't that interesting? So it's not a 
um, a negative riot, like you would think of people, you know, lighting buildings on fire and, and hurting people, overturning cars. But it's the kind of riot where people, people are just partying it up, that kind of a, a riot, which we don't usually think of in our modern context, but that is one of the ideas there. And this is what they do. They, they live for luxury. Now remember back in verse number three, when he says that they, they make merchandise of the believers through feigned words, and then they use that ill-gotten gain that they get from naive believers, they use that so that they can live in the lap of luxury. I mean, we see some very obvious examples of that today. This is the, these are the Kenneth Copelands and the Joel Osteens of the world, right? I mean, raking in millions and millions of dollars a year. And where is all that money coming from? From naive people. And ironically, or else by design, I don't, I don't know which way to categorize it, but they'll point to that wealth and they'll say, see, it's true. Believe like I believe and do what I tell you and you can be rich too. Only it seems that the only people that are getting rich off of this teaching are the people teaching it and the people that are following the teaching are getting poorer. They suppose that gain is godliness. And as Paul pointed out, we need to draw, withdraw ourselves from those kinds of false teachers. So they, they're living in the lap of luxury. They're living for luxury. And then he says in verse 13, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They even bring their indulgence into the church by reveling at church dinners. And I put together this little sentence just for you tonight. They pollute the potluck with their poisonous propaganda. They come to the church dinners and they feast with God's people, but while they do it, they're sporting themselves with their own deceivings. They're there fellowshipping among the believers and taking that as an opportunity to spread their false teachings as if it were some kind of a game to them to lead people astray. Jude, again, says a very similar thing when he says in verse 12, these are spots in, their, in your feasts of charity when they feast with you. Their stains, their blemishes, their marks. They feed themselves without fear. But still, their lusts go even farther. Because verse 14 tells us that it's not just luxury that they live for, but licentiousness as well. It says, having eyes full of adultery. And understand, this was written long before the modern scourge of pornography. But it's exactly that kind of thing that Peter was referring to. Eyes that are full of adultery. False teachers, because they are driven by their flesh, are often addicted to lustful images and ideas. They cannot cease from sin, verse 14 says. I'm not going to belabor this point because I don't have time to really go into it tonight. This is not a minor problem we're talking about here. This is a major problem that is only getting worse in our culture due to the ease of access to pornographic material through computers and phones and tablets available readily to anyone through the internet. And the harm done by viewing pornography and dwelling on immoral thoughts cannot be overstated. Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And Peter here identified the addictive nature of this when he said they cannot cease from sin. And that's the kind of people they are. On the outside, they may look like they have it all together, but on the inside, they are full of corruption. And so naturally, they're unstable people. Beguiling, unstable souls, verse 14 says. You cannot be steadfast and unmovable when you are following your fleshly impulses. It's just not possible. 
because your flesh is too inconsistent. It wants one thing one day and another thing another day. They're beguiling and unstable. Their inconsistency should be a huge red flag to us. That their doctrine is false and we should therefore avoid them. Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King and meddle not with them that are given to change. Don't mess with people who can't get their act together and be consistent. Now, I know we grow and growth means change. But this is talking about something different. This is talking about instability. False teachers live according to their lusts. They exploit others to fund their luxurious living and they view other people as objects to be used for their immoral pleasures. Number three, the third folly we see in this passage is the sin of greed. The sin of greed. The rest of verse 14 down through verse 16 talks about this, beginning with that phrase, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Because false teachers are driven by lust and pride, it should come as no surprise that they're also covetous and greedy. The one thing that they're really good at is practicing covetousness. I like this expression. They have exercised their hearts with covetous practices. It's their favorite form of exercise. They jump at the chance to get money out of people. They run here and there collecting their ill-gotten gains, all while refusing to lift a finger to do any real ministry. And he says they're cursed children. The word children there can be used metaphorically of anyone who depends on something, is possessed by a desire or an affection for it, or is addicted to it. They are addicted to, possessed by the idea of getting more and more and more. They're covetous and greedy. And so now Peter brings up another Old Testament example of a false prophet to illustrate the kind of greediness that these New Testament false teachers are guilty of. And the prophet he mentions is the infamous Balaam. says they've gone following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, verse 15. The story is a very interesting case study here. As he says, these false teachers forsake the right way and follow the path of greedy Balaam. The story of Balaam is recorded in Numbers 22 through 24. Just to recap, Israel at this time is encamped near the Moabites, and they are afraid that the Israelites are going to do to them what they had done to the Amorites. They were, going to, they were afraid the Israelites would destroy them. And so Balak, king of the Midianites, contacts Balaam, a prophet of the Lord, and offers him fame and fortune if he will come out and curse the Israelites. In exchange for the money, he wanted Balaam to curse God's people. Well, initially, Balaam refused, but Balak persisted. And finally, Balaam agreed to consult with Balak. And it was on his way to that first meeting that an angel of judgment met Balaam in the way. Only Balaam was too blind. He didn't see it. His donkey, however, was not too blind. His donkey did see it and turned out of the way. This happened once and Balaam got angry at his donkey. It happened again, and the donkey crushed his foot against the wall. And Balaam got down and began to curse his donkey and began to hit him. And on that second occasion, the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak back to Balaam. Listen to this from Numbers 22, verses 28 through 31. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Not I thine ass which, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. What happened in this story was the mute donkey spoke with a man's voice 
and demonstrated more sanity and reason than the prophet of God. The donkey spoke up and said, Listen, I have been your faithful donkey for a long time. Have I ever done anything like this before? And he said, No. You know what astonishes me about this account is that Balaam didn't seem to think it was strange having a conversation with a donkey. Nor did he heed the lesson because he continued on the same path. Three times he would try to curse the Israelites and each time God would not allow it. Every time Balaam opened his mouth, a blessing came out instead. And finally he returned home, but not without his reward. He never cursed the Israelites. He never spoke a false word against them. But what he did for the love of money was much worse. He taught Balak how to entice the Israelites to bring God's curse upon themselves. In Numbers 25, after Balaam goes home, the Bible says that Israel abode in Shittim and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Numbers 31.16 Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. And Revelation 2 verse 14, if there's any doubt in your mind, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. That's what Balaam did. He taught Balak how to get the Israelites to bring God's curse upon themselves by sinning. And he did that for the love of money. He was a prophet for sale. And his love for money was his downfall. And it's the same for false teachers today. That's the case that Peter's making here. They're just like him. They will say whatever they have to say to get what they want. They're consumed by greed and do, will do whatever it takes to grow their wealth so that they might live in luxury and indulge their fleshly desires. So you can see why their influence would be so dangerous. They're not concerned about what is best for you and me. They're consumed by the lusts of their flesh. They think they're better than you and everyone else. So they don't have to listen to God-given authority. They want to rob you so they can live in pleasure and satisfy their immoral desires. They would be willing to sell you out to pad their own pockets. And so it's of the utmost importance that we develop godly discernment and not allow false teachers to influence us with their deeds or their doctrines. Folks, folks it is all around us. You don't have to go any farther than the book section at Walmart. And I guarantee you, you can find a pretty broad selection of false teachings right there. It's available literally at the tip of your fingers. Get on the internet. Just start Googling a few Bible questions. I guarantee you, you'll be able to find some false teaching pretty quickly. It is everywhere. We cannot afford to be naive. We must have godly discernment. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that encourages and instructs us. May we be firmly anchored in the truth. Lord, I understand that it can be very confusing sometimes. There are some hard questions that we ask, ask ourselves in life or that others ask us that we don't always know a good answer to. And sometimes it's hard for us to see through the fog of confusion about certain things. But Lord, I pray that even though we have that challenge, that we would always come back to the simple truth of what we know your word says. Help us to be mature Christians, not be carried about with every wind of doctrine. May we be settled. May we be steadfast and unmovable. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.